Thank you. Uh, good morning. Today is Monday, December the 7th. This is the Cosmetology and Barber Examiners Board Meeting, and I will uh, read notice of this meeting, a notice for this December 7th, 2020 meeting of the Cosmetology and Barber Examiners Board, uh, including the date, time, and location has been noticed to the State Board of Cosmetology and Barber Examiners website since August the 3rd of 2019. Additionally, this meeting agenda has been posted to the website since Thursday, December the 3rd. And I will start uh, by doing roll call vote to assure that we have quorum. We'll start with our chair, Ron Gillahan. Here. Vice Chair, Ms. Rebecca Russell. Here. Kelly Barger. Here. Ms. Judy McAllister. Present. Thank you, Ms. Patricia Parsons. Present. Thank you, Ms. Mona Sappenfield. Present. Mr. Frank Ambusa. Here. Ms. Amy Tanks. Here. Ms. Anita Charlton. Here. Ms. Wilbert Granger. Present. Ms. Susan Witcher. Here. And Ms. Janie Ross. Here. That is fantastic. We have all of our board members uh, present, and I appreciate it. Because this is being done telephonically, we will have to do roll call vote for anything that needs to be motioned. I will turn it over to Hugh Cross, attorney for the program, to do the statement of necessity. If you can go ahead and do that. Thank you, Hugh. Absolutely. According to TCA Section 844108B2, if a physical quorum is not present at the location of a meeting of a governing body, the governing body must file such determination of necessity, including the resuscitation of the facts and circumstances on which it was based with the Office of Secretary of State no later than two working days after the meeting. Furthermore, TCA Section 844-108-A3 defines necessity as matters to be considered by the governing body at that meeting require timely action by the body. That physical presence by a quorum of the members is not practical within the period of time requiring action and that participation by a quorum of the members by electronic or other means of communication is necessary. This is the routinely scheduled meeting for the Tennessee Board of Cosmetology and Barber Examiners, and the purpose of today's meeting with the members attending by teleconference is to discuss the agenda as noticed on the website earlier. Now we'll need a motion to accept that statement of necessity. Mr. Parsons, I make a motion to accept the necessity. Thank you, Ms. Parsons. We have a motion by board member Patricia Parsons. We need a second, please. This is Mona Sappenfield. I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second by Ms. Mona Sappenfield by roll call vote. Ron Gillahan. Yes. Rebecca Russell. Yes. Kelly Barger. Yes. Judy McAllister. Yes. Patricia Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Mona Sappenfield. Yes. Frank Ambusa. Yes. Amy Tanksley. Yes. Anita Charlton. Yes. Vic Ranger. Yes. Susan Witcher. Yes. And Janie Ross. Yes. Thank you. Uh, board members, next on our agenda is the approval of the October 2020 board meeting. Uh, the minutes for this meeting were emailed to the board members along with the redacted legal report and the agenda, which all could be sent via email. Um, uh, if you have any corrections or changes, this would be the time to let me know of those. If not, we need a motion and a second to accept those on the record and then post them to the board's website. Do we have a motion? A motion. I'll make a motion yeah, to yeah. accept. Ms. Patricia Parsons, thank you. That is a motion to accept the minutes as sent to all the board members. Do we have a second? I'll and second. Frank. Frank. Thank you, Mr. Frank Ambusa. I've got you seconding. And by roll call vote to approve the minutes as they were presented. Ron Gillahan. Yes. 
Kelly Russell? Yes. Kelly Barger? Yes. Judy McAllister? Yes. Patricia Parsons? Yes. Anna Sappenfield? Yes. Frank Ambusa? Yes. Amy Tanksley? Yes. Anita Charlton? Yes. Yvette? Yes. Susan Witcher? Yes. Janie Ross? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we will move forward with the appearing before the board. We have four school presentations and then our 2021 continue education. On the presentation that was made available through SharePoint, uh, board members have had a chance to review this prior to today. And if you have it open today, I welcome any questions. I will start with our first item. This is the Institute for Barbering and Natural Hair. This is a school change of location. Ms. Tanisha Effinger is participating. Ms. Tanisha Evger is participating telephonically. She's available to answer any questions you might have. The school is located in Memphis. It is 2,400 square feet. The application floor plan and an updated student agreement have all been received timely. Uh, Ms. Effinger also provided a note stating that she's moving uh, to get a larger uh, space due to COVID-19 and social distancing. So Mr. Gillahan, I'll turn it over to you to see if you have any questions or anyone else does. Thank you, Roxana. Um, it was the uh, the Institute for Braiding and Natural Hair uh, instead of barbering. Uh, so it's just a, it is just an address, but not not a uh, program change. Um, uh, it is I braiding. I apologize. You are correct. It's the Institute for Braiding and Natural Hair. I apologize, and it's a change of location. Yes, sir. That is correct. Right. Um, as I've looked at the uh, uh, layout and format, I didn't see anything that was missing from that, and the contracts would not have necessarily changed except for the address and uh, uh, perhaps contact information in that regard. So uh, I didn't see anything that uh, stood out as missing from this particular application. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Um, board members, anyone else have any questions? And if there are none, we would need a motion to accept this uh, change in location. And then the only other clarification I need is if we will be sending a board member along with the field inspector. Um, the only thing since this is our first school for this meeting that I want to point out is it's it's becoming a little bit difficult you uh, to, to send board members out. And I know that we can all understand with social distancing uh, concerns with our health, putting you all in danger as well. Um, I don't know if maybe for the change locations for those schools that already have a reputation of knowing what they're doing, of following our statutes, if we can rely on the field inspector only to not have to demand as much of the board members, again, mostly due to the odd times we're in. Just something for us to discuss. Um, Mr. Gillahan, what is what is your thought on that? Uh, you know, the inspector is there to check these bills. If we were having major contract changes or um, anything of, of that nature, I, I would, the uh, board member would need to go and take a look. I did have a question that just came to mind, and I'm not certain how far the school is moving and whether that's going to present a, a difficulty for the students. Uh, is there anyone from this school online? Yes, Ms. Effinger is available. If you can answer that, Ms. Effinger. You're asking how far the school is from the current location? Yes, ma'am. It's about between eight and ten miles away is not really far away. It's still within the city. Okay. Have any of your uh, current students expressed any any uh, uh, issues with uh, traveling that far? That's not a very great distance, I understand. No, actually, uh, the new location is kind of more centered into the city versus where it was uh, to begin with. Okay. All right. Very well. Uh, that's the only question I had. Thank you. All right. Thank you. This is Yvette Granger, and I do want to uh, make a move to the change of location. I worked with Ms. Aventure um, in the past before, and she has a very, very great program. I super, really, really love her, and um, she got very good things going on, and the location is amazing. That's Thank wonderful you. to hear. And, and 
Mr. Gallagher, am I correct to understand that unless we have a reason um, that you and, and the board members would be okay just sending the field inspector on these particular changes? That's correct. Okay, Ms. Granger, are you okay with that motion? You're motioning for the school um, to be accepted to be inspected, but it would only be with a field inspector. I'm completely okay with that. Fantastic. So we have a motion by Ms. Wyvet Granger. Do we have a second? This is Mona, and I will second that. Thank you. We have a second by Ms. Mona Sappenfield by roll call vote to approve the school to be inspected by a field inspector for their new location. Mr. Ron Gillahan? Yes. Becky Russell? Yes. Kelly Barger? Yes. Judy Callister? Ms. Judy McAllister? We'll come back to see if we can. Thank you, I heard you now. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Patricia Parsons? Yes. Mona Sappenfield? Yes. Frank Gambusa? Yes. Amy Tanksley? Yes. Anita Charlton? Yes. Matt Granger? Susan Witcher? Yes. Thank you. And Jamie Ross? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have DAY College of Cosmetology. This also is a school change in location. On your presentation, it starts on page eight. Uh, this is with Ms. Amanda Holmes, who is also available, um, or someone from the school is to answer any questions you might have. This school is located in Jackson, and it is 4,500 square feet. The application, floor plan, updated student agreement were all received timely, uh, as well as the previous in uh, school presentation. We will include this to be a field inspector inspection only. And Mr. Gillahan, I'll turn it over to you for any questions um, before we proceed. Thank you, sir. Um, thing in your uh, college curriculum. Uh, as far as the change of location, I understand what we're probably going to look at there, but I saw something in, in your curriculum where it indicates that you're going to have theory class from 8 until 9.30 with a 15-minute break. Um, and it says before the practical work begins. And then you have another line directly under that that says practical work is from 1 to 4.30. Uh, are you indicating that you're not going to be doing theory or practical during that? Uh, intermediate time. Uh, I understand lunches are scheduled in there as well, but from 9.30 to 1, um, that's just something I noticed in your curriculum. It's probably, um, I would imagine, just, just a uh, typo or a misprint, but would you care to address that for me, please? Holmes, do we have you on one of the um, individuals calling in? Ms. Amanda Holmes? Ron, I don't see her on the call. Um, can definitely follow up. We can we can see if she yeah. call, you know, when we get done, she's on. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading that as I'm reading that picture statement in her curriculum. Uh, I believe what she's intending here is that she's got a statement about her theory and a 15 minute break, but it just leaves out that she's going to come back to the break and continue with theory or practicals. There's just a, a break in that that stuck out in my mind as I was looking at it. So if we can get a little clarification on that, that should, that should be uh, sufficient. Um, okay. I didn't see anything else uh, in this particular case uh, as well that um, uh, stuck out for me. Uh, I would be okay with the, uh, with the regular inspector uh, going in and uh, uh, doing his inspection on that without a board member, if that's what everybody else wanted. Okay. I had a couple of questions that I'd like a little clarification from her on. The first is, is says the day, I guess it's the enrollment agreement. It says uh, high school diploma, GED, or actively enrolled in high school. 
So I just want to make sure that that is actively enrolled in high school, but credit um, requirement that we require. Um, there's a can cancellation policy. It mentions um, completing the course early. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, is 1500 hours is required so I'm not sure how a student would complete the course early so I had a question about what that looks like and then lastly it was uh, during a schedule delay for school closing such as for weather or something like that. it says um, if there's a one hour delay they would start class at 9 30 and they would um, go to school until one and it is counted as a full day is what it reads in that policy that it's counted as a full day. So I just wanted to make sure that we are not awarding hours for a full day worth of energy, um, if they're only attending a few hours. I, I'm, I'm looking at what you're bringing up and um, Ms. Holmes, have you joined us? I think some of your points, unless I mean, if the board members agree to those items uh, or the enrollment agreement being clarified, sent to us, as as you are aware, with a change of location, all we really need is the application and floor plan. We don't necessarily have to have the other items, um, but we, of course, welcome them. Anytime there's a change that impacts the students or the public, I ask for those items. The statute for a change of location relies or 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 needs the floor plan since that should be the major change. So sometimes these things are um, that come up give us a chance to help fix some items such as the school closing like you point out Miss Russell. Um, I will take the board's guidance and she is not participating if, if the board wants these updates um, made by her sent to me and then we send an inspection. I'm fine with that. I would point her to listen to the recorded meeting so she makes sure and catches each of the items pointed out. Uh, otherwise, she would have to reappear in February. Roxanne, it's Ron. Uh, do we know uh, in this particular application, did she submit uh, her updated uh, enrollment? documentation yes. and of course stuff she did so then she this, did uh, this would be her current uh newest version of that uh, and perhaps there may have been some changes for up since her last uh, it, it uh, with this new information it probably would be better if uh, a board member actually went and uh, took a look at that as well perfect I will ask her to make the changes after listening to uh, the comments made, made by both you and Ms. Russell, and then uh, we will schedule an inspector to, to uh, do the inspection in Jackson as well as a board member. If, if that is the consensus, we would need a motion and a second. Do we have a motion? This, this is Judy McAllister. I make the motion uh, for, to do this with the things that were discussed. Perfect, Ms. McAllister. We have a motion by Ms. Judy McAllister to send a field inspector and board members when the Appropriate changes being discussed here are made. I would schedule the inspections at that point, uh, but a board member will also be going in order to view those changes. Uh, we've got somebody that's joined us that'll need to mute themselves, please, and we do need a second on that motion. Patricia Parsons, I'll, I'll second. Thank you, Patricia. We'll have a second by Ms. Patricia Parsons. By roll call vote, Ron Gillahan. Yes. Becky Russell? Yes. Kelly Barger? Yes. Thank you. Judy McAllister? Yes. Patricia Parsons? Patricia Parsons? Yes. Mona Spinfield? Yes. Frank Ambusa? Yes. Amy Tanksley? Yes. Anita Charlton? 
Yes. Wyvette Granger? Yes. Ms. Witcher? Yes. And Janie Ross? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, our next presentation is on page 21 of our presentation. This is the Memphis Hair Academy. This is a new school application for an apprenticeship cosmetology school. Ms. Melanie Mall is hopefully joining us telephonically. Uh, Ms. Mall has opened a um, school, another school prior to this, that is the Memphis Skin Academy. It was opened in 2018 as a specialty aesthetic school. And then a second location was approved and opened in October of 2020. Both of those locations are in Memphis. This campus is also op uh, located in Memphis. The school is 3,500 square feet. The new school application curriculum, blank enrollment agreement, uh, floor plan, and contingency plan were all received timely. This location will be an apprenticeship uh, only cosmetology school. And Mr. Gillahan, I'll turn it over to you for any questions you might have. If everyone can make sure to mute themselves. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of my er er earliest notes on this is that the Memphis uh, Hair Academy is the name on the contract and the, uh, excuse me, it's the name on the application and the Memphis Skin Academy is on the contract. So we've got a little discrepancy there um, that would definitely need to be uh, corrected to see which one is uh, uh, the correct name for this entity. Uh, since you mentioned the process that there was the uh, already uh, the one school existing. Uh, I can understand how that could easily get mixed up, but we need to get that straightened out. Also, um, I noticed that um, shortest length of the course uh, in their curriculum is 60 weeks, but in their uh, uh, price structures and refund charges and overtime charge uh, statements, uh, it says they're going to be charging students an overtime charge after one year of attendance. So 60 weeks is obviously greater than one year. And if that's the shortest length of their uh, of their uh, program, then uh, they're placing a student in a scenario where they're all automatically over time. Uh, that seems like a pretty significant change in my mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't know that I've found the exact page that you're po pointing out, Mr. Gilham, but, I, but I've got it. That makes perfect sense. The overtime item needs to be completely change to to match the one and a half times for apprenticeship schools and it is um uh i believe it's it's these this information is scattered in several places throughout the time. okay so it's okay. probably going to be pretty difficult for a student to uh, uh, be able to have good clear information if they're going through this particular application um, um right. miss mall are you on the call with us and I actually notated that as well, so I'm making notes as you go along. Oh, you are there. Thank you. Thank yes. you. I will then mute myself and let you let let you okay. care. Great deal. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so, is the name of the organization actually the Memphis Hair Academy, or is it the Memphis um, Skin? Uh, we may. Skin we may still keep it with the Memphis Skin Academy since I was um, explained that the name wasn't necessary of importance. So since everything has been established under the Memphis Skin Academy and with this just being an apprentice piece, we may still keep the name as the Memphis Skin Academy. Um, I, I would uh, probably uh, beg to disagree with you just a little bit there. Uh, okay. The student who's, who's enrolling in the school uh, would, would have an expectation uh, of learning about hair or about skin. And if there maybe there's some confusion there of whether they're learning both. Uh, and, and of course you and I uh, and the board members would understand, you know, uh, the differences of one program versus the other. A novice student walking off the street might have, have the impression that they're gonna be receiving something based on the name of the building, the name of the contract, things like that. Okay. Um, so just a, a little more clarification on that so that the the, uh, uh, the names would uh, actually uh, line up better. Um, but I am quite concerned about this business of the uh, 60 weeks versus um, um, any time over the year. 
uh, uh, of the calendar year, I guess, or the uh, class year. Uh, so, yeah. uh, I, I see that as a pretty big uh, uh, fix that would need to be made here. Okay. Uh, I also had a question. Uh, this is going to be uh, an in house uh, residential. Uh, people are coming and learning at your school, correct, for the yeah. first 750 hours? Yes. All right. Do you have sufficient um, um, trainers uh, in the field with sufficient experience and, and whatnot to uh, and licensure to be able to provide the um, practical training once they've left the um, school site? Yes, I do. I'm actually already partnered with several salons and spas within the inner city, and I've actually already have contract uh, partnerships with those. Um, they do meet the 10 year licensure requirement. Okay, okay. Um, of course, uh, you already realize there are several uh, additional uh, requirements for any apprenticeship program. I know you're already working with one, I believe. So, yes. uh, as long as as long as we're meeting those requirements as well, um, yes. I think that the I think that the uh, information that needs to be really clarified and cleaned up regarding your uh, your cost policies with your overtime charges. Uh, again, I think that's a pretty big fix. Yes. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know that I want to hold you out and uh, have you represent at the next meeting in order to do this, but uh, I, I'll say I wouldn't be comfortable until, until those changes are absolutely made and that's clarified a little better. Okay. Okay. Understandable that can be done. Now, I do have one question though. If I do decide to go with, okay, the Memphis Hair Academy, should I get a separate business license with that name? Um, I know what to do today. Um, I, I really can't advise you on something okay. like that. I would, I would just, uh, in, in my own personal practice, my own personal opinion of this, I think. Um, I think all of my business entities would be correctly named according okay. to what it, what it was. I'm okay. not suggesting that I'm not suggesting at all that a business can't have a business name and then have several other uh, entities under that umbrella. But I, I am saying that I think that that for the board purposes that would need to be made quite clear, and for your students' purposes it would be uh, need to be made quite clear. Okay, doable. Uh, those were the comments I had on this, and I'd appreciate anybody else if you have anything to please jump right in. And Patricia Parsons, I agree with you. I think it needs to be clarified for the students that might be enrolling for sure. And I don't have a, I don't want to withhold her from moving forward, but I would like for her to make all the corrections that need to be made and clarify for the students' purposes as well as the board's purposes. And after doing that, if Roxana receives it and everything looks okay, I would like to make a motion to give Roxana the permission to make the proof. Upon Thank correction you. Of reporting. Would that be with an inspector and a state board member or just an inspector? This is an apprenticeship school only, so you you actually uh, went straight to my question. Normally, because it doesn't uh, involve practical hours that involve the public, board members haven't been going to apprenticeship only schools. Um, so we can stay in line with that and simply send a field inspector and let me review all of the documents. If I have any questions or concerns, um, Hugh will obviously assist me, but otherwise we would send a field inspector if we're keeping in line with other apprenticeship schools. Uh, however, if the board sees differently and you yourselves want to look at the contracts, then we have two board members in the Memphis area that I would, um, you know, impose the inspection on. It is your decision, Ms. Parsons, since you made the motion. I believe a field inspector, since it's an apprenticeship only school, would be significant for me. Okay, okay. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? This is Becky Russell, and I just wanted to add uh, one extra thing. I had made some of these notes, but um, in phase one of cosmetology, uh, chapter one, it's screen careers, opportunities in aesthetics, and that is within the cosmetology uh, portion. So we might want to see that change to cosmetology, and that's just kind of one of those cleanup things on this 
um, contract. And then um, beyond that, I will second the motion um, that Patr Patricia made. Thank you. We have a second with Ms. Becky Russ for from Ms. Becky Russell. She just points out one other item regarding the the chapter that covers cosmetology and aesthetics, and that's actually under the cosmetology discipline. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Having a motion and a second uh, by roll call vote. Unless there are no other questions or concerns, I will start with Mr. Ron Plan. Yes. Ms. Becky Russell. Yes. Kelly Barger. Yes. Callister. Yes. Shepard. Yes. Yes. Mona Sappenfield. Thank you. Mona Sappenfield. Yes. Frank Ambusa. Frank Ambusa. Thank you. Ms. Amy Tanksley. Yes. Anita Charlton. Yes. Yvette Granger. Yes. Susan Witcher. Yes. And Janie Ross. Yes. Thank you. Next on page 36 of our presentation that was on SharePoint, we have a new cosmetology apprenticeship school. This is DCI Academy of Cosmetology. Ms. Destiny Cox has hopefully joined us here to answer any questions you have. Uh, Ms. Cox opened DCI Academy in February of 2019 as a specialty aesthetic school. That school is located in Memphis, and this school is also located in Memphis. This school is 1,191 square feet. It is a uh, cosmetology only school for um, apprenticeship. The school application curriculum, blank enrollment agreement, floor plan, and the contingency plan were all received timely. I will turn it over um, to Mr. Gillahan, and right now I have this school going with just a field inspector because it's apprenticeship and to be consistent. But um, Ron, I'll turn this over to you for any questions you have. And hopefully Ms. Uh, Destiny Cox is on the phone with us. I am. Thank you, Roxana and Ms. Cox. Uh, it's nice to speak to you. Um, uh, I did have a couple of notes and I'm going back and forth on my phone here just to double check and make sure. In your application, um, in your application summary, uh, you listed your organization name as dcicosmo at gmail.com. Uh, is that the correct name of your organization? No, sir. That has to be a mix up. I would get that corrected. Okay, and, and Ron, actually, I think we will be able to correct that internally. I asked the same question, and I think we can type over it. Um, it it's her email, so it was in the wrong line. So I believe the application itself and the name of the school, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Cox, is DCI Academy of Cosmetology. Is that correct? Yes, it's DCI Academy School of Cosmetology. Academy School. Okay, so we will make that change. That is exactly what I thought that was going to be. Um, um, let's see. And this is a specialty school with the apprentice program. Those, the square footage of that school is fine. Um, Ron, it's really specialty because it's full cosmetology. Okay. Her current school would have been, yes. Right, right. Uh, the specialty is a different category. Um, same thing. Uh, it's oddly enough, the same thing that I'm noticing. Uh, with previous case. Uh, in this application, I noticed there was a major discrepancies on the uh, refund policies uh, on page, um, I believe, 453 and 454. Let me, let me, those are our page numbers, so let me see where it is in her program here. Um, What I'm referring to is there's there's some language that indicates that at a certain point there's a, a full refund and it, uh, other language that indicates in the same point uh, that there's um, a refund except uh, items such as the students' kits and uh, some uh, materials that were given to them. Those pretty uh, pretty major uh, inconsistencies. And since they're located in different places here, again, I think a student would get pretty well lost in that. 
um, um, I'm scrolling through, pardon me for, for taking okay. this moment here. As pertaining to the materials um, that are given out at a certain um, hour point, um, when it, are, you, are you coming from the agreement or the catalog? Well, let me take a look here. Okay. Uh, School of Cosmetology, DCI Academy, hybrid online apprenticeship. Um, so this, this appears to be the catalog, but the catalog and the contract ought to reflect the same information. Okay, uh, I will get that so, corrected. Uh, Roxana on our forms, I believe, um, I believe part of it begins on page 47 of of our um, uh, presentation that you and I and the board members see, and yes. also on page 53 and page 54 of our presentation. So wherever that lines up in her uh, contracts and agreements, it's that's where it is on our uh, information. That is um, Also, also this is indicated as an online program. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I um, sent over a waiver request, a proposal to waive the um, square footage since this, the students will not be in-house. This particular program will model our already hybrid online program that has been very successful since the uh, passing of it in June. Um, the one reason that we wanted to do this particular proposal, it would also mirror the same space that we're in now, but we do have hours that we are not using this space. We do not have an evening program. And so um, we wanted to, on that on the time that the building is not being used for aesthetics and our steady students are gone, it would then shift over to a new staff and um, availability for the Cosmo program. Okay. Okay. So, um, are, are are these um, are these online programs being administered live, or is there anything being done as self study? It is live. We have two components. The high component is a streaming, where they meet with their instructor a certain amount of hours daily um, for the upcoming cost program. They will meet with their instructor upcoming daily, and it's been very successful with our aesthetics program. And also the students get to complete the assignments via the Milady, um course guidelines. And we have back office. We see what's being what's going on. They can come in once a week or um, I think it's every two weeks. They would come in to test um, at a particular time. And then that would be it until it's time for them to stay board prep. Okay. Okay. Um. And we do have staff that is um, right now, currently we have three educators that are working our um, program here for the aesthetics. And I'm also bringing on two additional educators um, for our Cosmo program. Okay. Uh, and your program is in the evenings, Monday through Friday, uh, from five yes. until 10, correct? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So Roxana, in the event that we, uh, uh, when it's time to do those inspections, that would have to be uh, noted for our field inspectors. Thank you, Ron. Yes, as, since this is apprenticeship only, if the board is comfortable with that. Um, Ms. Koss, is this the the exact space that you use for the current aesthetic specialty school? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So the difference obviously in schedules would allow this to happen if, if the board's still comfortable with just sending a field inspector. Yeah, that, sh that should be fine. There's no paperwork or need for us to waive square footage. If it's apprenticeship only, there are no practical hours. Therefore, that changes the dynamic of, of the space needed. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, just those uh, those items being corrected and uh, mentioned, I think uh, that satisfied my question. Thank you. I will get those corrected immediately. Do we have any other questions? 
this is Becky Russell. Um, along kind of the same lines that Ron was talking about, I found a discrepancy in two areas. This um, type of work that she sent in. Um, on page 42 of our presentation, I'm not sure how that falls in her student catalog, but 42 of our presentation says that um, it's $10 per hour if a student does not complete on time. And then on page 50, it says it's $100 per week if a student has to complete on time. Yes. yes, I've highlighted that as well. I knew that you guys were going to mention it, so I apologize for not getting that done. It will be corrected today. Okay, that's the only additional notes that I had. Thank you, Ms. Russell. I appreciate that. Do we have a motion for the school to proceed or any other questions? This is Mona. I'll make a motion for the school to proceed as planned. Thank you, Ms. Appenfield. We have a motion by Mona Sappenfield with uh, the updated items that have been reviewed by Mr. Gillihan and Ms. Russell turned into my office so we can review them. And if those are all satisfactory, we would be sending a field inspector to uh, inspect the site and hopefully license the Cosmetology Apprenticeship School. Do we have a second for that motion? Judy McAllister, I'll second. Thank you, Ms. McAllister. And I roll call vote. Mr. Ron Gillahan? Yes. Thank you, Russ? Yes. Ms. Kelly Larger? Yes. Ms. Judy McAllister? Yes. Ms. Patricia Parsons? Yes. Mona Sappenfield? Yes. Mr. Frank Ambusa? Yes. Ms. Amy Tanksley? Yes. Ms. Anita Charlton? Yes. Ed Granger? Yes. Ms. Susan Witcher? Yes. And Ms. Janie Ross? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, to all of our um, school owners participating. I appreciate that. That concludes that portion of our appearing before the board, and we will make sure to get all the updates and schedule these inspections. Next on our agenda, we have the 2021 Continuing Education Seminar requests. And before we get started, I'm going to take a moment just to recap what transpired during this year. As, as everyone on the call is aware, we had to make drastic changes due to COVID-19. I believe in the end, only two sessions were ever canceled or changed. Uh, one particular provider did not opt to, to do the virtual lessons, and so she did cancel hers. But for the most part, all of our sessions uh, moved to this virtual world, the synchronous way of learning with the actual provider for the seminar being available through Zoom, I believe, has been the platform of choice. And then our instructors have done amazing taking advantage of that. They have been energetic. Um, it, it's just been really from my perspective, being able to participate on almost all of these this time, um, a joy to see the industry take off like it did. So I welcome any feedback from the board members um, that were able to attend. Um, we've got, as we go through the 2021 items, I will point out which of those are still hoping to do in person, and hopefully they will remain that way and not have to change. Um, but a lot of them are gonna offer the virtual um, given the situation. So. Um, any comments from our board members that were able to go? I know Ms. Ross was able to do one. Ms. Granger, I think you were able to do a couple. I welcome any of your thoughts regarding not necessarily just the specific, but how it went and, and um, just anything you want to provide feedback to. I, I welcome this would be a good opportunity. Patricia Parsons, I attended a couple of them and they were pretty much flawless on my end. There were some people that had some issues getting log on, but I just think it was the server. But most, all right. all of them, no problem. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Parsons. Really glad to hear that. Yeah, and this is Yvette Granger. Um, I actually think that it was an amazing turnout. Um, those virtual sessions reach way, way more people than they would have if they were coming in person. Um, I think one one session that I witnessed went up to about 200 or over 200 people online. So I think that it was great. It was flawless. The energy was still there, and um, it was it was good. 
I mean, even though COVID happened and it set us back and turned us into a new type of normal, we are still not missing any punches. Um, all lines are crossed and all eyes are dotted. So it was a great thing. Thank you, Ms. Granger. I, I love the feedback and hearing your experiences. Um, anyone else? A any concerns? I will point out that I have the, the joy of looking at the reviews and the evaluations and I, similar to what Ms. Parsons and Ms. Granger have said, I didn't see any downside in the evaluations. They seem to be just as um, happy with the items. Um, the fun thing is there was no criticism about the food, which is a, a joke. Usually that is that one low point we get. The food wasn't that great, so that didn't happen to, to be needed here. But um, I, I think the energy was incredible. It did make it easier for me to be able to participate in a lot more that I normally wouldn't have been able to for our providers that offer two to three, four sessions. There's just no way I can justify the, the time away from the office and, and the expense to go. But this was easy. There was one day where I did two sessions and the next day did another one. So that wouldn't have been possible under uh, our old ways. And so that was really a good thing. I believe only one or two courses had issues with individuals being bumped off and the providers have just been fantastic. They've made everything available, understood. Sometimes technology isn't perfect. I had one session that was a nightmare and it was just our state connectivity. I kept thinking it was me. Um, and so I kept getting bumped off. Fortunately, it was the only one, but it was enough of a nightmare that left me thinking, OK, we've got to have a, I've got to have other paths if this happens again to our shared drives. And so I imagine that some of our instructors participating did have that technology piece, but uh, none had to come to the board or to our office with concerns or complaints because the providers worked with them. So um, I, I commend every one of our providers. I couldn't be more impressed with how they ran with this. I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to say that. And then we will go like we usually have one by one and make sure to approve the sessions and the dates uh, and update the website as quickly as we can. And then I will email all the board members the updated dates and times so that since we're not together to pass around the sign up sheet, at least virtually, we can kind of pick a date. And um, if, if there it's an in person session, obviously, we hope that'll stay on the records and, and our COVID concerns will be part of the past and we'll be able to hold those. But in any case, once you all sign up, I'll make that available to everybody and hopefully all the members are able to log in to one or both days. And so um, we can give you know feedback and make sure everything's on task. So thank you for the members that dis did participate in 2020. It was very, very, I think very needed and I'm sure our providers really appreciate your feedback and you being there. So Okay, I thank you for your time on this. I just want to make sure we could recap what all has happened in 2020. Um, on your presentation, the first item that we have, I, I made a sheet that will look tentative um, to what the board website will update, which will include everybody. But uh, if on page 59, you could start. This is the first session we have is for the University of Tennessee. This is the Knoxville UT Conference Center. Uh, they submitted their information for the instructor continuing education and are requesting Sunday, July the 18th and Monday the 19th. At this time, the session is to be in person. And if anything changes, we would update the website. I don't know if Jeremy is on the call with us, um, the board members have any questions, but otherwise we would need to approve those dates and their session being in person. have any questions we would need to do a motion and a second and if it's okay with the board when we finish all of these we would do roll call vote at the end to accept everyone mr gillahan would you be okay with that Roxanne, that's fine i'm looking at this first one and uh, of course i'm familiar with every one of those uh, presenters and uh, i think most of us are familiar with the quality of the program at uh, over at uh, UT so um, I think this is a great program and I think that we yes we should uh, take the vote on all of them at once at the end thank you sir 
Do we have a motion to approve Sunday, July 18th and Monday the 19th for UT Knoxville? This is at the conference center and this session is scheduled to be in person. And, and I second the um, information with Ron. I've, I've attended theirs in Knoxville every time. I know Ms. Kelly Barger has gone. Becky Russell's very, very active with this session. Um, I, I think Mr. Frank Ambus has gone at least on one occasion. So we've got almost all of their evaluations are always phenomenal. And uh, this year, the interesting thing, we were able to record our individual sessions in advance and then participate the day of to answer the questions. So in, in my opinion, it, it was almost the perfect of both worlds because then you knew your presentation was out there and recorded and had no glitches and then you came on board the day of to answer questions so just to kind of give some feedback on that patricia parsons i make a motion to approve thank you we have a motion by Ms. patricia parsons do we have a second judy mcallister i second McAllister and we will do roll call vote at the end. So next we are looking at a presentation for the educators success session. This is Ms. Stephanie Brown and I know she is with us. I don't know if the board will have any questions. Her sessions again, Ms. Granger, I think explained them is are extremely dynamic and energized. Uh, she is asking for three different virtual dates. So at this time, all three of her sessions would be done probably using um, Zoom and they are March 7th and 8th. June 6th and 7th and October 24th and 25th. If the board has any questions or other comments to add, I welcome those. Otherwise, we would need a motion. Patricia Parsons, I make a motion to approve. Thank you, Ms. Parsons. Do we have a second? Second the motion, Jenny Ross. Thank you, Ms. Janie Ross. We have a motion and a second. We'll move on to the next one. This is PBC Incorporated, and um, they are on page 65. If you're following along with your presentation, this is Ms. Pearl Walker and Ms. Celeste Harris. Uh, they've submitted their information for the instructor continuing education for two separate virtual dates. Both of these would be virtual, January 31st and February 1st, and then September 19th and 20th. Um, if you have any questions or comments on hers, I welcome those. Otherwise, we would need a motion. Peter McAllister, I make the motion to accept these dates. Thank you. Do we have a second? Get back, Granger. I second that motion. Thank you, Ms. Granger. We have a motion and a second, so we will move on with roll call vote at the end. And next, we have the 2021's alternative teaching methods for these unconventional times. This is put together by Mr. Thomas James, and I know he is on the call with us if the board has any questions. Uh, he is asking for three separate dates. The first session is in April, and he is doing that one virtually on April 25th and 26th. The next session is in Murfreesboro, June 27th and 28th, and the last one in John Johnson City is on September 26th and 27th. If the board has any questions, we welcome those. Otherwise, we would need a motion for his three sessions. Richard Mont Parsons, I make a motion to sort the dates. Thank you, Ms. Parsons. Do we have a second? Ms. Becky Russell, I will second. Thank you, Ms. Becky Russell. We have a motion and a second. We will proceed with the next item. This is the Beauty Educators Leadership Conference. This is put together by Ms. Destiny Cox, who joined us earlier for our new school application. She has submitted her application for four different dates. All four of these are virtual sessions. She is doing one each quarter. So the first quarter is February 7th and 8th. Second quarter is May 16th and 17th. The next quarter is August 6, 15th and 16th, and then her last session for 2021 is November 7th and 8th. I welcome any comments or questions, and if there are none, we need a motion to approve hers, please. Judy McAllister, I make the motion to approve. Thank you, Ms. McAllister. Second? Patricia Parsons, second. Thank you, Ms. Patricia Parsons. Okay, the next and last item uh, presented before you is Making of a Master. This is KINCC Education Group with Ms. Kimberly Anderson, and I know she is on the call with us. She has provided uh, continuing education uh, information for seminars for a total of seven sessions. 
the first three that I will go through are virtual sessions and um, hers again, similar to everyone's that I had the joy of participating, very dynamic, um, very good feedback from everyone. Uh, these sessions are for March 7th and 8th, July 11th and 12th, and August 22nd and 23rd. All three of those are virtual hours and would offer the two full days, in other words, 16 hours. The next item sort of um, items she's presenting or requesting from the board's approval is two different virtual sessions, and they are split into four hour increments on four different dates. Uh, and I'm glad Ms. Ms. Anderson's available if the board has questions, uh, but, but these, it would work. Each one of the days is only four hours for the total of 16 that the statute requires. So the first session is April 17th and 18th, May 1st and 2nd. So it, it, if whoever joined us could put us on mute. Thank you. Um, that still then totals the 16 hours. And then the second session she is offering is October 1st and 2nd and October 16th and 17th. Again, four hour increments for a total of 16 hours. And then the next item she is presenting is an in-person session in Memphis, June 13th and 14th. So those are her separate requests. I welcome any questions or feedback the board has. And if there are none, uh, then a motion. Roxana, um, I had a question on this one. Um, I'm looking at um, her uh, screenshot here and uh, Memphis in person, 13th and 14th, yes. Uh, what is the real description of this independent learning at your leisure? Um, is this something that is supervised? Is this uh, a self-paced study? Uh, you know, we've had several issues with those kinds of programs. So if she's online, could she uh, talk to me about that, please? Okay, so I'm here. Good morning. Thank you, guys. Um, the in person, of course, is um, at a location with the 16 hours for two days. The independent learning is the same independent learning uh, that we had proposed on last year uh, due to COVID. We did not get it up and running. I am making the same proposal this year um, for your review. The shell has been there. All of the coursework has been loaded. Um, and I'm hoping that I will receive a approval pending um, the board members that we had originally said, or if you want to include new board members, I welcome that opportunity as well uh, to serve the educators of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what I'm asking is, is that part of the program, is that uh, symmetrical learning, uh, uh, such as a, a, a Zoom pre type presentation where the attendees are actually being supervised by the uh, instructors, or is this something that some, someone simply logs into at any time of the day or night and completes on their own? It, it is actually a combination of both. Uh, they will have the opportunity to learn at their leisure primarily, but there also will be some live sessions. Um, one of the uh, challenges that has been with the independent learning, of course, has been the the time that it's taking for them to complete the session. There have been some uh, challenges and concerns about them completing it quickly um, in a quicker amount of time than the required 16 hours. So that's why there is a dual um, aspect of learning to ensure that those hours are met as well as uh, the content is information that the educators can use to uh, be better at their craft. Roxanne, it's Ron again. Um, I believe that I, this particular component yes, sir. Is, uh, uh, in this presentation, um, as far as in person, that, absolutely, I, I would have no question or problem with that. But without having reviewed uh, the current uh, iteration of her independent um, program uh, as to whether or not it can be manipulated and and the time factors uh, sped up uh, as, as we've all uh, discussed in the past. Um, I'm not sure that I would be comfortable approving that portion of this program. 
and, and I understand, I believe that is what you and Ms. Um, Russell had been kind enough to volunteer your time to look at. It sounds from what you're stating and from the last communication that I saw that we're not quite there yet ready to approve that. Um, so I didn't list it as one of the items possibly being approved, but still considered. So I'll be happy to go back and forth with Ms. Anderson and see what else. Um, and it and it isn't li limited to you or Ms. Russell if we can have others take a look at it. But at this point, it is still a little bit difficult to, um, as she stated, make sure that the individuals at their leisure doing this learning are still doing the 16 hours as required by the statute. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Okay. All right. So we can list it as something to come. And the minute it gets resolved, obviously, we can present these uh, requests for approval throughout the year. We tend to, uh, I think we all agree that it's more efficient to approve them all together so that instructors get a good visual of what they have to choose from for the following year if their CE is, is required in the next year and they're up for renewal. So. Um, Ms. Anderson, I welcome any other changes to that, and we'll get a couple of members to still look at it if you wish. But for now, I believe we're looking at the three virtual lessons uh, sessions and then the two virtual sessions. If the board members don't have any problem, it, they're a little bit different in that they are four hour increments, but they do still total the 16 hours and then the one in person. So if that's the case, that's what uh, we would be voting on right now. And, and any other feedback or questions you have, I really appreciate Ms. Anderson being available because I knew hers, um, as you can tell, is just very dynamic and, and is thinking outside the box for those instructors that can't sacrifice a full eight hours. You know, this this cutting it into four hours is different and new, and I think they'll they'll be interested people in that. So, Roxana, uh, at this point, we'll be looking for a, a motion on this one to approve those other uh, components, uh, but not the independent learning portion of this. Is that correct? Correct. That is my thought, uh, because we still have a situation where the two board members that volunteered, yourself and Ms. Russell, um, the, it, you still could not get the the, the the comfort or the reassurance that, that the time was tracked correctly so that it, it truly is the 16 hours. So we'll, we can keep working on that. I mean, that could be fixed by April or, or, you know, the February meeting, and then we reintroduce it. For now, I don't think it's ready to go. Patricia Parson, I make a motion to approve all the virtual requests she's made, but not the independent learning one. Okay, and that includes also one in person in Memphis in June. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Parsons. Do we have a second? Judy McAllister, I'm, I second that. Thank you, Ms. McAllister. And at this point, we've presented all of our continuing education sessions. Before I start roll call vote to approve all of them by roll call vote, I wanted to point out uh, the University of um, the Tennessee State uh, University here, TSU Avon campus. They will be submitting theirs. Um, as we can all understand, universities are faced with unique challenges. And so they they just quite have what they wanted to do for their session. It will likely be in person and be in August, as is their tradition. But I'll probably be presenting that one in February. Just so I just we've been communicating with them, but I understand that they're in a unique situation. So uh, we will present that when it's ready. Otherwise, all the other um, requests by our Providers have been presented and by roll call vote to approve all of these as motioned and seconded. I will start with, with Mr. Ron Gillahan. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Becky Russell. Yes. Ms. Lee Barger. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Judy McAllister. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Patricia Parsons. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Mona Sappenfield. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Frank Ambusa. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Amy Tanksley. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Anita Charlton. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Wybeck Ranger. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Susan Witcher. Yes. Thank you, and Ms. Janie Ross. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we are on to the legal report. And so in a second, I will mute myself. Uh, that redacted report was emailed to everyone and I will turn it over to our litigating attorney for our cases. That's Michael Underhill. Mike, I'll mute myself and let you take over. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Yes, we can. Um, as you can see from the legal report today, we have 71 total items, 44 from cosmetology, uh, seven from Barber, and then we have 20 represents. Uh, I'll go ahead and open the floor to any questions that the board may have on um, any one of these items. Hey, this is Ron. I'm just taking just a second to get to that. I had a question about um, shops that are closed, um, such as case number four. Um, sometimes it appears or the shop is closed. I don't know if it's closed for business, if it's just closed that day. If it if the furnishings, for instance, for a shop are still there, um, are we going back to make sure that these shops are indeed closed for good? Um, for instance, I think on number four, it was unlicensed activity. No licensed manager um, was on duty. So when we went back, then the, the shop was closed. So are we just checking to make sure that those remain closed? And I saw that there were several different um, instances where shops were closed. I just don't want us to overlook something. Maybe, you know, they were closed that particular day and not uh, not for good. Okay, and you're referring specifically to item number four? Um, so four and eight is a similar case, and there may have been one more, but uh, item number four and number eight. I wonder if I can answer from the process perspective of what the inspectors do. So um, if, if a complaint is open like this for unlicensed activity, um, Michael Underhill having our, our litigating cases, he might decide to follow up um, and, and uh, you know, ask an inspector to go or routinely if something has come back in the mail, like, like an agreed, you know, a citation, because we can, we can, if they don't have history, we can send an agreed citation earlier on. Um, so the board, the field inspectors go out routinely to look at these. And if the shop is closed, that actually means they're not there. It's not that they're closed for the day. We look in the window. We make sure that that, that shop has moved, in other words. It wouldn't be just, you know, closed. Even if it looked like it's closed due to COVID, we wouldn't consider that necessarily an out-of-business closure. And that's, um, and Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what the field inspectors are looking for when they let legal know they're closed. It is a true closure of that location. That's exactly that, what I needed to know, that it's a an out-of-business closure. So, right. thank you. And that, right, right. And that's what we do on the licensing side. So, on the licensing side, we will put the shop out of business, even if the license itself still had a year and a half to go. The fact that we have gone, seen, looked in the windows, nothing is there. And in some cases, it's a whole other business altogether by the time we go. That's what we note. And so, if the shop or those owners turn up somewhere else, we still have this history of the complaint we could reopen if needed. Um, and that's how then Michael would be presenting it. We just have nothing to go on because they're no longer there. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, I would request a motion to approve the legal report. And we'll continue to work a little bit after we finish 
Trisha Parsons would like a motion to approve the report. Mona Steppenfield, I'll second it. Thank you. We have a motion by Ms. Patricia Parsons and a second by Mona Sappenfield and by roll call vote to approve the 71 cases as presented by Mr. Underhill with no amendments. Mr. Ron Gillahan. Yes. Ms. Becky Russell. Yes. Ms. Kelly Barger. Yes. Ms. Judy McAllister. Yes. Ms. Patricia Parsons. Yes. Ms. Mona Sappenfield. Yes. You, Mr. Frank Ambuza. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Amy Tanksley. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Anita Charlton. Ms. Anita Charlton. We'll move ahead. Can you hear Ms. Me? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you, Ms. Anita. Was that a yes? Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Wybeck Ranger. Yes. Yes. Ms. Ms. Susan Witcher. Yes. Thank you, and Ms. Janie Roth. Ms. Janie Roth. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. We've got all of the legal report done. We are moving forward with absolutely our administrative report and it starts with our applications for examination. If you will give me a minute and I can switch back. Um, if you're following along, this starts on page 77. So on our applications to test for felony, we have a total of two individuals, Ms. Molly Brown and Mr. Michael McCall. These applicants have felonies within the last three years and or are currently incarcerated. This request is being presented for them to take the Tennessee examination with the board's approval. Um, the information has been provided with the disclosure of um, the uh, felony situation as well as a letter of recommendation. These are submitted for your review. The board um, historically approves an agreed order for a probationary period of two years. Unless you see otherwise, please let me know if that is the case. I will um, see if you have any questions and otherwise we would need a motion and a second to proceed with the uh, uh, probationary orders for these individuals. Judy McAllister, I make the motion to approve with the agreed two years probation. Thank you, Ms. McAllister. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Jenny Ross, I second the motion. Thank you, Ms. Ross. We have a motion and a second by roll call vote to approve these individuals with the um, agreed order for two years probationary license. Mr. Ron Gillahan. Yes. Becky Russell. Ms. Becky Russell. We will come back. Ms. Kelly Barger. Yes. Thank you. Judy McAllister. Yes. Patricia Parsons. Yes. Mona Sappenfield. Yes. Frank Gambusa. Yes. Amy Tanksley. Yes. Anita Charlton. Yes. Wyvette Granter. Yes. Susan Witcher. Yes. And Janie Ross. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next on your iPads, we have one more item regarding um, the initial license, and this starts on page 88. This is an application from uh, Ms. Melody Teresca. This is for a manicures license. Uh, Ms. Teresca had first applied by reciprocity in March of 2020 with a Pennsylvania license. Uh, Pennsylvania requires 1,250 hours. The certificate that was provided had been altered. Their reviewing officer for the professional affairs for Pennsylvania confirmed to our board that the information was altered and not accurate. Her license had in fact expired in Pennsylvania in 1998 and therefore uh, she didn't meet the requirements for reciprocity. Ms. Tereska then attended a school in Middle Tennessee as an apprenticeship student. She passed the theory exam in July 2020. At that point, she worked on her practical hours under the supervising professional. Uh, 
She took and passed the practical exam on a, October 1st of 2020 before the practical hours were completed and provided to the school by the supervising professional. The school owner from Tennessee communicated with the board explaining that they had not approved the practical exam to be taken, nor had the hours been completed. Ms. Tereska has in fact now passed both exams and completed all of her hours. Um, let me know if the board has any questions. At this point, she's met those requirements and she's being presented because of course there were a few situations that I don't believe the board would have been comfortable with, so they're there for your review. But at this point, I would recommend that we go ahead and approve her for licensure. I make a motion that we, this is Nona. I would I make a motion for licensing. Thank you. We have a motion by Ms. Mona Sappenfield to go ahead and approve her for licensing. Is there a second or any other questions? Uh, Roxana, this is Ron. I've got several questions on this one. Um, first of all, um, uh, I'm really super concerned that she was able to uh, manipulate the system and get into a scenario where she could uh, attest to her hours in the state uh, registration system. That well, and reserved I, for a right. school system to, get to do that. It, it didn't go down that way. If I could explain what happened, um, and, and, and since you submit hours to PSI, you'll definitely understand, Ron. So when a student finishes hours, let's say 1,500 hours for, manic for cosmetology or barbering, and in this case, 600 for manicures, the schools upload them to test. For a traditional student, that would be when they finish everything, and only the schools have access to that, so this would not have been any different. However, for your apprenticeship students, there is a different test code that schools must use. So if you have an apprentice manicure student, and that was her case, you submit her to PSI test, and the school did. The school owner and instructor verifies that they did, but you use a different test code because they're not a traditional student. That test code is important because after they take the theory and they can take it as many times as they need to until they pass, they are then blocked from the practical. Unfortunately, the school entered the wrong code. They didn't enter the apprenticeship exam. And so it didn't block her from taking her practical. Um, the school acknowledged that that's what cost her to be able to take the practical earlier and she did pass it. The exams are the same. It's the code is important because of this. It blocks them from the second exam. And the second reason is for statistics so that our schools can know how our apprentice students are testing, which by the way, they're testing uh, and passing at a higher percentage, but we, that's the reason the code is there. If the school uses and, and accidentally enters just the manicuring code, then that block isn't there. So it was almost the perfect storm. It isn't that the student tried to get into PSI um, incorrectly. Yes, she tried to get into test, I assume, before realizing that she'd finished the hours or that they'd all been submitted or that the school ass actually said you can't test until a certain date. But um, they didn't do anything wrong necessarily within PSI. That makes sense, Mr. Gillahan. It, it By using the wrong code, it allowed this to happen, unfortunately. Okay. So, so, and I'm very familiar with that process uh, of, of registering those students in there. Um, what I'm hearing is that this student was not intentionally trying to uh, uh, circumvent the system and, and go around uh, to, to get registered for this exam, correct? I think she, she probably knew it was too early to take it would be my guess um, and was in, ready and in a hurry. She would practiced in Philadelphia for years, so obviously she's knowledgeable of the material. Um, and she had been told by the school to wait until the end of October. So there is email communication that you all saw on page 96 from the school saying that they informed the student that they could not test until the end of October. So there was some knowledge of that. Uh, the student probably went online to see if she could get a seat. And then when she could, she did it and she passed. So. Um, that's the reason she's before you. There's some situations there that took it outside of my ability to approve her. Nevertheless, she's passed both and gone to school was the reason for my recommendation. She's probably very ready to get out there and work and provide for her family. Sure. 
Um, yeah, that's that sounds like something we may need to uh, kind of take a look at and see if there's a, a scenario that, that we can prevent that from happening again. Because I can, I can foresee potentially students um, finding a, a a loophole or a weakness like that, and uh, uh, really, really going after that to not necessarily complete their hours, and then uh, if they go forward, for the apprenticeship. That be a problem for the apprentice program, and and then we would uh, have a difficult time, you know, figuring out. Had they actually yep. completed the practical portion or not? So, so uh, uh, that's something we'll probably take a look at um, uh, going forward. Uh, but uh, that was my my concern, yep. and I think you uh, you've alleviated most of that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. And the the code is there, but you're right. If someone uses this is the first time it's happened. The other checks and balances that we've established is for my team that's entering our apprenticeship students to get them that first license that that time frame makes sense between one exam and the other. Right. So um, and, th and that's how we caught it and questioned the school. So um, We'll, we'll keep looking at this and see how else to, you know, make sure that the schools are really cautious with the code they use. But I appreciate that feedback. So if we have any other questions. Trish Parsons, I'm in agreement with Ron. You know, this can happen once we need to really check, but the schools are going to have to be accountable too. Yeah, but upon this one circumstance, I, I'm with you, Roxana. She's already passed both of them. She's ready to go to work. I make a motion to approve. Thank you. So we have a motion by Ms. Mona Saffenfield and a second by Ms. Patricia Parsons. I think in reviewing all the documents that were presented, everyone agrees that there's reason for concern. We will keep looking at other options and it may be also educating the schools uh, that are doing the apprenticeship. But as everyone knows, um, you don't need a special application to do the apprenticeship. You just really have to be cognizant of the steps and be careful with these things. So uh, we do have motions properly made by roll call vote to go ahead and approve a Ms. Uh, Melody Tereska's license. I'll start with Ron Gillahan. Santa, I'm going to abstain on this. OK, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Becky Russell. Yes. Kelly Barger. Yes. Miss Judy McCallum. Yes. Miss Patricia Parsons. Yes. Miss Mona Sappenfield. Yes. Mr. Frank Ambusa. Yes. Miss Amy Tanksley. Yes. Miss Anita Charlton. Yes. Miss Wyvek Granger. Yes. Miss Susan Witcher. Yes. And Ms. Janie Ross. Yes. Thank you. We are moving on then to our reciprocity applicants, and we have two. The first one is an application on your presentation. We start on page 98. The, uh, application for reciprocity of a manicures license from Ohio from M for Amber Gooden. The certification shows an initial license in December 2014. Ms. Gooden answered the felony question and submitted court documents regarding the case. Otherwise, she meets everything required for reciprocity in the state that she is licensed because of the felony um, situation and, and the parole piece that she has here listed. I believe she's presented everything that the board needs. I would recommend that this applicant be given an agreed order for the two year probationary period like we do with our Tennessee applicants. And otherwise, um, once that order is signed, approve her for reciprocity. Judy McAllister, I make a motion to approve with it. Uh, agreed. Uh, uh, Perfect. Thank you, Ms. McAllister. And do we have a second for that? Patricia Parsons. Thank you, Ranger, second the motion. Thank you. I have both Ms. Uh, Parsons and Ms. Granger. I will write down uh, Ms. Patricia Parsons uh, voiced in first. And this is an approval of the license with the agreed order for the two year probationary period like we would do for any of our other felony applicants. Otherwise, her reciprocity requirements are all met by roll call vote. Ron Gillahan. Yes. Becky Russell. Yes. Arger. Yes. McAllister. Yes. Patricia Parsons. Yes. Ms. Happenfield. 
Frank Gambusa? Yes. Amy Tinsley? Yes. Anita Charlton? Yes. Wybeck Ranger? Wybeck Ranger? Thank you. I think I was able to hear a Susan Witcher. Yes. Janie Ross. Yes. Thank you. Uh, next on your presentation, this is a reciprocity application for a master barber license from New York for Dan Rager. The certification shows an initial license from at least September 2015 for New York. Um, and if you had a chance to review this, that is actually the language used in the New York certificates. Uh, they do not maintain records longer than five years, so licenses actually say licensed at least September 15. 2015 and it's valid until 2023. He is also licensed as a cosmetologist in Virginia and has been since 1999. Mr. Rager um, has stated that he's been licensed for 25 years and that he never took the Barber Theory exam. That is an exam that um, is not offered and, and does not always reflect on the New York certificate. His license uh, was approved internally. I went ahead and approved his license on November the 12th, given that he substantially met all the requirements. He has licensed more than 10 years, and the thought of keeping him from working for the last three weeks um, was, was something I knew that the board would understand and we would, we would talk about. Um, he has taken, of course, the practical exam and has the 10 years licensure. He was only missing the theory exam, and this is that first time that we are looking at someone like this. We in the past have approved, uh, the board has given me the authority to approve anyone that is missing the practical exam but has the 10 years experience. He is the other way around and he has way more than the 10 years experience. He was missing that theory but also licensed in two different states. Uh, so at this point, I would request, I guess, more than recommend that we accept the fact that his license has been approved uh, given that he had more than the 10 years experience and licensure, I apologize. It's t more than 10 years of licensure. Judy McAllister, uh, I make the motion to approve because with that, that much experience, I think he should be licensed and be able to work. Thank you, Ms. McAllister, I appreciate that. Uh, do we have a second? Frank Gambus is a second. Thank you, Mr. Gambus. I appreciate that. And um, I, let me do roll call vote and then we can chat about this topic before we get off track. Uh, Ron Gillahan. Yes. Thank you. Becky Russell. Yes. Kelly Barger. Yes. Judy McAllister. Yes. The Parsons. Yes. Mona Sappenfield. Yes. Frank Busa. Yes. Amy Tanksley. Tanksley. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Nita Charlton. Yes. Beck Ranger. Yes. Some Witcher. Yes. And Janie Ross. Miss Janie Ross. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so if, if it is OK with the board and again, this was that first time that the theory exam was missing, um, we are seeing more and more changes come up and, and a lot of legislative um, items are going to be coming up here in the next few months as sessions open up in different states. So if it is OK with the board for us to use this logic in the event it comes up again, if the individual has 10 years of licensure or more and is missing one of the two exams, uh, would the board be okay with, with us, um, the, the office having the authority to approve those? Peter McAllister here. Uh, yes, uh, I was looking on page 110 uh, and it's the uh, state of New York. Uh, Correct. And it says qualified by examination. So. Right. And, right. And it is practical only, unfortunately. Uh, th that's why it's a little bit unique, but we're going to be seeing, I think, some of these changes where some states are dropping one or the other exam. 
uh, with with COVID-19, a lot of us, I would say at least 25 to 32 states have at least once every three weeks or four weeks participated on Zoom meetings and, and shared, you know, our, our what each state was doing, what is happening, what's happening with the exam locations. This has been a unique time for every industry, definitely for this one. So um, I know that a few states have had to look at the exams. If there is no availability, if there are no practitioners, if the sites aren't safe, all those issues. And I don't know that this will stop being an issue. But uh, with this gentleman, like I said, I just could not in, in my heart and knowing you as board members and everything you look at, I just I just knew he met the requirements except for that exam and that you would okay it other except we hadn't addressed the theory exam. So um, if this comes up again, it, it, I would like a motion if the board's comfortable with us treating the theory like the practical. Obviously, if they're missing both, and we've talked about this using uh, Florida as an example where we've got aesthetics and manicures that don't take either exam, the board is not comfortable with both those exams waived. So nothing would change there, but if the board is comfortable treating the theory like the practical and, and they still have that other one, being okay approving them with the 10 years experience, I don't know if we'll have many more. Or this is a one-time thing. I would make the motion to, to allow you that. Thank you, Ms. Judy McAllister. We have a motion then that going forward, similar to the one the board had given me probably a couple of years ago, if not long uh, more, to, to do that with the practical exam with the person having 10 years or more experience. We, we have a motion then to give me the authority to do this and waive the theory. Would we have a second or any other conversation on this? I welcome thoughts or concerns. Attorney Ross, I second the motion. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Hearing no other uh, concerns, I will take roll call vote uh, to add this motion going forward then. Mr. Ron Gillahan. I roll call vote, Ron Gillahan. If we proceed and see if we can draw on. Uh, Becky Russell. Yes. Thank you, Kelly Barger. Yes. Thank you. Judy McAllister. Yes. Patricia Parsons. Yes. Anna Seppenfield. Yes. Frank Ambusa. Yes. Amy Tanksley. Yes. Anita Charlton. Yes. Beck Ranger. Yes. Susan Witcher. Yes. Janie Ross. Yes. Yeah. Are you with us, Ms. Gillahan? Uh, I'm back. I got cut off there for just a second. Um, uh, yes. We understand. Yes. Thank you very much. We understand perfectly. Um, okay. Moving along on our agenda, we are on our miscellaneous items. Um, we have, I believe, three items here. The first one is on your iPads. Give me a minute. We're on page 114 if you are following along. Uh, this is a request to waive the need to retest. This is pursuant to Rule 0440-1-.10, which states an applicant must apply for. If whoever joined us could put us on mute. Thank you. Um, which states that an applicant must apply for and pay for the original license within six months after passing the examination. The board may, for good cause, waive this requirement. The board previously authorized me to go ahead and approve these extensions for up to an additional six months, but nothing past a year, uh, and these need to be approved for good cause only. You have before you an, a request by Ms. Andrea Ellison. She's provided an explanation that she was under uh, many financial struggles, death in the family, even living in her car. She passed the practical exam on April 3rd of 2018. And so she is requesting the board's consideration to not have to test. And I welcome any questions the board has um, in order to approve or ask her to retest. Roxana, what is the what what is uh, the board's recommendation? You know, this is this is new chartered water, and funny enough, uh, once we decide on Miss 
um, Ellis's situation, Ellison's situation, we had one on Thursday reach us, but they've not been able to give me the explanation of what happened in those two years. So I figured I would let the board know that we would also need to look at uh, the same or similar with Miss Melanie Smith who will be providing her information. I don't know what to recommend. I'm, I'm really stuck. Her her explanation is very detailed. Um, it it it. It is very sad. It does say she had her father passed away. She had financial struggles, was distraught, maybe wasn't thinking about her license. Um, obviously, the statute is pretty clear and lays out the six months. I believe the schools all teach that from at some point that, you know, once you finish and you pass the exams, you can't work on that alone. You you need this license um, and and miss it sometimes it is due to documents needed for qualified alien status sometimes it is we're seeing now with the low income waiver sometimes they'll forget to give us proof of Medicaid or uh, so we mail letters immediately if we get the application with something missing so that they know it's not complete it's not licensed yet I don't know that we've seen any go two years and so at this meeting you have one in front of you with a detailed explanation and one that hasn't gotten me the detailed explanation yet but it is almost identical in that the two years have passed so I think it's a good opportunity for you as board members um, to discuss because it, it's it's uncharted waters a little bit the, the statute would require that she test flat out but you do have that that room for consideration so I didn't help you Judy I didn't. Go ahead. Has she had a cosmetology license before? No. No, so she is asking for her first license. And I believe in her statement, there's there's a little bit of confusion, something about trying to renew or stabilize. Right, renewing her state cosmetology license. So the good thing about us working remotely is I'm going to, while the board asks any other questions, I'm going to pull her up and see if I missed adding to my notes the fact that it was a reinstatement exam. I don't know that that would change um, the dynamics, but but I want to say that she might be reinstatement and had, had a license that expired in 2007. So I'm going to try to pull that up to answer your question while we're you know, going back and forth and, and the board decide, is this, you know, someone that we want to consider due to the financial and the different, I mean, obviously that would set her back if she has to take both those exams, just. This is Patricia Parsons. I know that with the COVID and stuff, NACUS and other organizations have given us a little leadway on some things during this time. Mm -hmm. But if it's a reinstatement, it is not. She's never had a license. I just pulled her up by her social. She's no. never had a license. This would be an initial. Um, and 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 again, her statements are not quite all clear. They definitely present good cause reasons for a lot having gone on in her life. Um, it, it's just a matter of. Do we set president? Obviously, even if the board considered this one and approved it, we can talk about the other one that we have, but I don't have the explanation to know if it's really good cause. Um, but, but, you know, are we setting president for these? And I don't know. This We've never had one this long. And she took one of her exams? And she took it. both. Yeah, no, she's she's taken both. So she passed the theory exam on March 21st of 2018. And then the following, not even month, two weeks later, April 3rd of 2018, she passed the practical. Uh, and the practical itself is is on the presentation. It, of course, starts with congratulations. You passed all parts of the cosmetology exams. Uh, you may start working in a licensed cosmetology shop immediately if you post your passing score with the receipt of the online registration. So the intent of that statement is you must go online and register and get your license. Post that with the passing score and you can work. And then the following sentence says, uh, this will not. This will only be valid for 30 days, 
after 30 days, if you haven't received your license, you may no longer work. And obviously, then then the intent is, you know, something happened, reach the board, maybe you moved, all those moving pieces. So the practical exam from our vendor PSI gives that information right on it. Um, but, but if you lose it or have other things going on in your life, then, you know, that may be I'm inclined since you did pass both, both exams. And with what I'm reading here, mm -hmm. is to go ahead and make the motion this one time to let to go ahead and do this. And I would welcome the other board members to if they have reservations or whatever, to please speak up. And this is Ms. Judy McAllister, correct? Correct. Judy, thank you. Okay, so we, we have a motion to approve Ms. Andrea Marie Allison this one time. Um, do we have any other conversations? And obviously, she would only be approved this one time. Is the motion, is the intent of the motion that we not do this to anyone, you know, to approve anyone else? Or I guess we'd have to look at them on a case by case basis. I think probably look at them case by case. I would agree, and and I hate that, you know, this other individual did not get a response to us, but I don't know what the explanation is different from Miss um, Ellison that provided a an email with, with some details that you all can review. Do we have any other questions, concerns, members? If not, we've got a motion. Um, Amy Tanksley. Yes, can you Amy. hear me, Roxana? This is, this is Amy. I just, I just want to say that Hi. as we get more, more of these, Right. I mean, I think we know that everyone yes. in our industry has been changed dramatically this year. Um, I think we'll start seeing some themes of if people have moved to the area or moved away or certainly not kept up with their ongoing education needs, if they're instructors, um, that I guess my feeling is we can take this on a case by case basis until we start seeing larger groups of folks needing the same thing. I get it. Absolutely. It, was that a second to Ms. McAllister's motion, Amy? Um, yeah, I'm happy to second the current motion. Okay. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve this. Uh, we are by no means then giving, which is great. I appreciate that. Me permission to consider these. Uh, I don't think we're going to change the path. Anything over the year, in other words, the law gives us six months. Um, the board has given me an additional six months looking at the good cost, but anything after that would have to come before the board at a meeting. I would not be able to make an exception. Um, any other concerns, questions, board members? and I'll give you a minute. Okay. Hearing none, I will go through roll call vote and this would approve her license. In other words, as long as she's filled out the application and paid for the initial license, unless she has um, you know, items that would exempt her and meet the low income fee waiver requirements, uh, we would be able to approve her license based on this motion. So by roll call vote, Ron Gillahan. Mr. Gillahan, we'll come back. Um, Becky Russell? Yes. Thank you. Kelly Barger? Yes. McAllister? Yes. Tricia Parsons? Yes. Mona Sappenfield? Yes. Frank Ambusa? Yes. Amy Tansley? Yes. Nita Charlton? Yes. Ryback Granger? Susan Witcher? Yes. Janie Ross? Yes. Thank you. 
Next, uh, under our miscellaneous items, this is a request to waive the reinstatement exam due to the continuing education requirement for cosmetology instructor Alicia McKay. Pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated 62-4-114, an instructor must complete the 16 hours of an approved training program, uh, and that is within their renewal cycle. It is at the board's discretion to approve up to an additional year extension for good cause. These requests are per, um, are supposed to be presented before the expiration date in order to approve that extension. Ms. McKay took an approved course on November 8th and 9th of 2020. However, that was one week after her license expired. She's provided an explanation uh, that her son was board born via an emergency C-section in September of 2020, which caused her to lose track of the dates and the requirement. Um, and so she's already actually taking it. She's just requesting that the board accept that continuing education so that she would not have to test and we would need a motion. Parsons, I make a motion to approve. Thank you, Ms. Patricia Parsons. Do we have a second? Judy McAllister, I second. Thank you, Ms. McAllister, by roll call vote. Ron Gillahan. Becky Russell. Yes. Lee Barger. Judy McAllister? Yes. Patricia Parsons? Yes. Moon Appenfield? Yes. Frank Ambusa? Yes. Amy Tangley? Yes. Anita Charlton? Yes. Warbeck Granger? Susan Witcher? Yes. Janie Ross? Yeah. Okay. And we still have quorum, so we're, we will continue. Um, let's see if some of our folks got bumped off. And the last item under our miscellaneous is a request from Mr. Logan Toady. I'm not sure if Mr. Toady's been able to join us, but I told him I was more than happy to present his request uh, to the board. And he is, he starts on page 119. Mr. Toady is asking for a waiver of the shampoo bowls from the equipment listed pursuant to 0440-02-.07 item 1 section A that says a shop shall be equipped with at least one shampoo bowl with hot and cold running water. Mr. Toady presented uh, an email explaining that due to COVID-19 he is not comfortable wor working in a salon and has many clients that are in the same situation. His business model is one for uh, clients to come in with appointments only and he does not provide shampooing. He only performs haircuts. He and I had um, just wonderful conversations as things transpired. Uh, he, he wasn't alone in those calls, just very nervous about what to do, how to welcome clients back, but at the same time protect everyone. And in his business model, he does uh, have many clients, if not most, that have some underlying health concerns. And for that reason, he just offers certain kind of services, as he states, haircuts only. We discussed, uh, I don't know if many of the board members were here when we approved a barber shop. It was many years ago in the Clarksville area that also had this wave. Um, waiver accepted for the shampoo bowls because they catered to our military folks and only did haircuts and therefore it was just a need they didn't have. So uh, Mr. Toady's request would be similar. It would be waiving a piece of equipment that normally we look for in the inspections, but he would have no need to put that in and he's waiting on the board's decision in order to open this location. If there are any questions, if not, we would need a motion. Roxana, does he meet all the other requirements with separate entrance and a separate bathroom specifically yes. for this? Yes, he would. He would. He was holding back on. I've, I've seen his, his tentative plan to rent. He was just nervous at making this type of if the sink needed to be there. And and you, you, I'm sure you know this, Mona, there are some of our facilities that have the portable sinks because they don't use them hardly ever, but they don't necessarily want to waive it. And so there is that option in his case. Um, he, he, he really wanted to know what the board would consider given that he'd never used it. So his goal was to have it waived altogether. Yeah, I have fielded a lot of phone calls through this year. Uh, mm -hmm because so many people do want to work out of their homes and uh, not even pursuing getting licenses because of, you know, having to replumb a part of their home, uh, you know, for mm -hmm. bathroom and that particular sink. 
and you know finding a way in with the door i mean there are reasons for those things so um I, I understand, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily use it. I, I understand. But, you know, we have to be pretty consistent here. And there isn't a military need from what I'm hearing. Um, what really makes him so much different? And his like, difference is his clientele. He does not open the doors to the public. His business model is strictly appointments. And so his clients have health issues. Most are immune deficiencies. Um, very severe illnesses. And so they are coming to him actually maybe with higher needs than our military. They just are not going to risk getting sick with their hair, their neck being cold, catching, you know, any of that. They're just coming for the haircut. That is his clientele. And it does cater to those that rarely leave their home now due to COVID-19. But, but that was also their reality before this. He's been very cautious who he takes in and, and being extreme with sanitation and those type of health concerns. Have uh, approved this for a barber shop, and if he's only just doing haircuts with the underlying conditions he has, I make a motion to approve. Okay, we have Miss Patricia Parsons um, approving the waiver of that particular piece of equipment, given his clientele and concerns. Uh, would we have a second? Judy McAllister, and I'm I second that motion. Uh, with, with the understanding that it is for hair cutting only. Correct, that that's the type of business that, that he runs. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. <coughs> okay, we have a motion and second. Any concerns, thoughts before we do roll call vote? Roxana, this is Ron. Can you hear me? I can perfectly. Thank you, Ron. I know, I know you've been having some problems. Yeah, I keep getting dropped out. Uh, Roxana, I remember uh, the previous case very well. The gentleman right. at Fort Campbell. Um, his situation was that, uh, just as you have described, but he, his uh, his uh, request was not to have a shampoo bowl put in there. Uh, he That's did what this one is. Have, yes. Um, he did already have a, uh, a wet station, a wet sink uh, at his counter uh, where he had hot cold running the water. Uh, you know, um, and that's what this one is, Ron. It is the shampoo bowl. He's 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 going to have water. It is the shampoo bowl that he would never use, and those are not easy to come by uh, and put in. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the uh, I appreciate his comments about his his clientele, but uh, and not being open to the public. However, I guess really under the governor's uh, recommendations, uh, no shot. No shop should be taking walk-in clients. Everybody should be working by appointments and uh, under the under the guidelines that are out there. They're not laws, uh, certainly right. The guidelines. Right. Um, right. Uh, but he he uh, I, I did uh, I think I read in his uh, information that there was uh, restrooms and water available. Do we know if that is inside of this unit or is it a community thing like? Uh, down the hall in a, in, a, in a, as it would be in a mall, because you mentioned it's a loft area. I, I don't because he really, until the board agreed, he just wasn't comfortable, you know, having the full, sending the floor plan, which of course shops and you all know that don't have to submit the floor plan. We go to inspect, uh, but he was looking at a couple of locations and understood and given his own concerns, uh, not for his clients, for himself, I would envision that what he's looking for is going to have the restroom right there. But of course, as we all know, it doesn't have to be right there. It could be, you know, outside as in, in a all our rules that we just passed actually right. even touch on that. So, but but having spoken to him and his concerns, I envision he's looking for something or has a couple of things in mind that include the restroom. They would just need to break down something and do something about the shampoo bowl, which now if the board approves it, he wouldn't have to worry about. Right, but, but he does, he is going to have hot and cold running water. Yes, in the, in the, in the space okay. available to him. Um, okay, all right. That answers my questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. This is Frank Gambuza. Uh, Hi. I, I, 
you know, the one-off sounds like, you know, yeah, you know, just let the guy slide. But what kind of precedent are we setting? You know, it doesn't stop him from doing all the things he wants to do, whether he uses it or not, just by following the, the state board uh, requirements. I just feel like it opens up a can of worms to where we're going to be case by case in everything if we start making one-off decisions against policies and procedure. Um, you know, to, to install a sink is no big deal to stay 100% within the guidelines. I, I, again, if it was a one-case scenario and, and it wasn't going to set a precedent for future decision-making, uh, it'd probably be no big deal. But I, I, I just don't like the precedent setting for what can come down the road, and this is already kind of made clear that we're that flexible. Uh, I mean, a, somebody put a sink in is is not really a, a major uh, this, expense. This or, a sink, though, Frank, this would be the shampoo bowl, really, that is used just for shampooing. That's the only thing that you are correct. I, I oh, and we have but, made, yeah, we've made a present. Yeah, and I, and I say sink, meaning a shampoo sink, yeah. basin. Uh, it's yeah. no different than it's, it's the same insulation as a regular sink, uh, Correct. you know, and chances are he don't do shampoos and everything. I mean, everything being legitimate, I don't question whether, you know, it's it's honest information. I just think it's like you can't pick and choose what requirements you like and don't like. Um, so, I, you know, and this is your big Granger. I, I totally agree with Frank about that setting the presence of it all so the only thing i want to remind you all is that we've done it already we have set the president simply because the business model for that individual was strictly doing haircuts and the clientele was the military that does not get shampoos and they saw no need in in needing to spend that money to bring something they weren't going to use we heard it and approved it Hit this need is not for the military, but in some form, it's actually for those that have underlying illnesses and are specifically looking to go to him and would not have their hair shampoo. They're just coming for the haircut. So it isn't the first time, but yes, you, you are all correct. It would be a waiver of a piece of equipment. Um, I, you know, again, Frank, I got no problem with saying, you know, if, if the military piece was the one that set precedent, then, you know, I would say and within certain mileage of a military facility and that being something consistent, but to just because that was set for the military, this isn't it. I don't see it being the same deal, even though it was, it's kind of the same request. I don't think it's apples to apples. This is Becky Russell, and I'd just like to say, um, I'd like to say that I want everyone to think about if this had been a mobile shop, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Correct. People doing this in a mobile shop, it says the equipment that's necessary to provide the services that they choose to provide. So if he got an RV without a shampoo sink, we would be approving, um, would be approving that is kind of the way that I'm looking at it. This is Kelly Barger. I have a comment also that even though we approved the barbershop on the military or near the military base, um, you know, to not have the shampoo bowl, we're not going and making sure they're not doing things other than military cuts. And I guess my point is I don't think we should um, differentiate these potential clients of the you know, person that's requesting the waiver, I don't think we should, um, you know, put their self, their, they're saying they have semi-disability or comorbidities. I don't think we should make that um, any less important than being on a military base and getting a military haircut. I, I, I think we got to be careful. We don't just start between licensing getting diluted down and our requirements getting diluted down. I think we're heading in the wrong direction. Uh, as I industry, would. Uh, this is going to happen. Yeah, this is going to happen. I tend to agree with 
Frank, and it was really, you know, he spoke what I was thinking. We, you know, have really been a strong board in staying very consistent. We have that one exception that was an exception. I would actually feel very strongly that this might open up a can of worms where everybody that wants to work out of their house and they don't have to do, you know, all the equipment, we're just going to just have a lot of cases come before us and, you know, not to be, you know, inflexible, but we do need to be consistent and there are laws, there are rules and everybody's opinion is really not what we sit on this board for. Mr. Logan Toady, are you on the call with us, sir? Okay. Um, let me start, and these are, I mean, this is the reason that we gather, I, so I, I think the conversation is fantastic and we can continue, but before we do, I do want to make sure that Ms. Parsons and Ms. McAllister are still comfortable with their motion, um, and then we can continue the conversations or we can take a roll call vote and, and see where we stand. Mr. Gilligan, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, this, uh, I have to say there, there is two sides to this, and we've heard both of them pretty well. Um, the slope being what it is, um, we've, we've addressed that already today. Also, with the, um, uh, uh, thank Frank. Ron, you cut off there. Can you hear me? I think we've lost Ron again. Um, let me go back to Ms. Parsons and Ms. McAllister. Are you still comfortable with your motions or are you withdrawing your motions? I'm still comfortable because I feel like we have done it before and we're trying to keep everything okay. even across the board for anybody that applies to us on the behalf of individuals under circumstances. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Ms. McAllister, do you still second that motion? I still do. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take roll call vote and see where we stand and see if, if um, Mr. Gilhan joins us and we have any other conversation. I don't want to cut us off because this is very good conversation. Ron, are you with us? So, Ms. Becky Russell, as, as the vice chair, are you okay if I proceed with taking vote? Yes. Okay, we'll start. I um, believe Ron has been bumped off, but Mr. Gillihan, are you with us? Okay, Becky Russell? Yes. Okay, and the vote for yes is to agree to allow the waiver of the shampoo bowl for this cosmetology shop. It is not a home shop. It would be a cosmetology shop when and if it's inspected and passes everything else. So we still don't have all of those pieces. Uh, Ms. Kelly Barger. Yes. Ms. Judy McCaster. Yes. Ms. Patricia Parsons. Yes. Ms. Mona Sappenfield. No. Okay. Mr. Frank Ambusa. No. Okay. Ms. Amy Tanksley. No. Ms. Anita Charlton. Yes. But can I say one thing? Um, and it's just for future conversation on it. Okay, I finish the vote um, and then we come back sure, to, to you right before I even count. Okay, yes. so I've got a flag here. Thank you. Ms. Wyvette Granger. Wyvette Granger, was your vote a yes or no? My vote is a no. Thank you. Ms. Susan Witcher. Yes. Thank you. Janie Ross. Yes. Okay. Mr. Ron Gillahan. Okay. Um, so go ahead, Ms. Charlton. Let me come back to you. Any questions you had or thoughts or concerns? Yeah. And um, just one of the things that I've always kind of with these situations thought of is, 
I don't know if there is some kind of way that we could try and do inspections of some sort. I mean, even when we were talking about the mobile units. And that's just my only concern is that to keep them accountable. If they're, if, you know, if they're saying they're, if, because, I mean, we don't have a disability. So, you know, it's a blessing for people with disabilities to have people that are willing to do this because it is rare. But in order to still have that level of accountability um, in our industry, you know, I would, I would, I would just like to try and, I don't know, figure out some kind of where we, where we could, you know, uh, do some kind of inspection or, or checking, you know, to make sure that they are doing only what they um, uh, are are supposed to do. That's that's all I wanted to add. So I think I don't know that this will give us the peace of mind or answer your question, but we have to inspect annually. And um, due to COVID-19, I can't guarantee that by year end we will have inspected all of our shops. Usually by August we're done, but we're going to be very darn close. So every shop gets inspected annually. And when we go in, the inspectors are looking for what the services are that are offered. So we do inspect. And so if in this shop, it's a full cosmetology shop, we would go in to inspect all cosmetology services. Some of our shops that are cosmetology don't offer the manicuring and pedicure. You know, they may not offer everything, but, but the equipment is there. So this shop, if approved, would have a letter waving the shampoo bowl. And so it would have to be very clear that the services offered do not include the shampooing. Does, does that sort of help answer Miss Charlotte? Ms. Anita? Uh, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, it does. It does. I just, you know, it, it, I, I guess I, I wasn't sure if they were included in the yearly or if it was just that initial oh, yeah. inspection. To no, oh, okay. no, everyone is. Everyone is included in the annual. There is no exception. If you have a license, we need to get to you once a year. We sometimes struggle with the shops that aren't open year round. We send them letters, having them tell us when they're open. Sometimes it's a family shop and they go away for two, three months out of the year. So there isn't a shop that we'd have any reason to skip if that makes you feel better. Um, okay. So let me gotcha. check, check in again. Yes. Mr. Gillahan, were you able to join us? Okay. So at this point we have 11 members that are available. That's more than quorum. We have seven that agreed and voted yes for the motion and we have four no's. Um, unless Hugh tells me I'm doing something wrong, um, Ms. Becky Russell, that kind of concludes that vote. Does that sound correct to you? That sounds correct. Okay. All right. We will then proceed. Uh, and the last item that I have before us is the director's report. Nothing huge. Um, we want you have on page 124, and I'm happy to get this out to the members also if you want it. It's that four year analysis that once the fiscal year closes, we have. And, and it looks in line with everything we've been discussing. We finished um, the 2019 2020 fiscal year with a little over a million left over. So it's, it's good. Our expenses we keep down as much as possible. I think we're at a good place. Uh, we'll be doing some additional possible uh, upgrades to technology and every program picks up those. So um, I don't see anything that is concerning. Thank goodness we're, we're pretty stable with revenue still consistent. We saw a slight decrease. Um, I think April and May were our lowest months with renewals lagging behind and obviously due to COVID-19 everyone expected that we've started to pick up again and I don't think our shops have slowed down from what we see a lot of movement has taken place meaning change in location and so that's been interesting but we don't see a, a drop in licensure that would concern us in any way so for the next uh, meeting in February I'm going to run our licensing numbers just to keep the members, you know, um, we can look at all of the different avenues. We do that once or twice a year. But any questions regarding our numbers from anyone? Okay. I don't think we needed to vote on that. The only thing I have on new business, and then I'll turn it over to our board members. We had one individual reach me this morning. Obviously, today was the meeting day, so it was a little bit 
uh, unexpected and I don't have anything to present before for you to consider, but if the board's inclined, I don't have a problem following what you'd like me to do with this. Um, this is for an applicant, Ms. Thai Cao, CAO. She was presented to the board in December of last year. This was a presentation due to a, an issue with PSI uh, testing and possibly, um, I, I don't have her information again in front of me, but it was either you know what we consider an incident in PSI, whether it's directly cheating or a situation that came up in the exam was stopped um, due to the security and the board reviewed her information last December. And the conclusion from that meeting was that she could not continue testing for her manicure license, had to stop for one full year, and then if she wished to continue testing, present that to the board. And so today they presented um, that they that on behalf of, of her, someone um, came to me that they wanted to present it. So I don't know if the board is OK since it's been a year with releasing her to start the testing again or if there's anything special that you do want to see. Thoughts idea this would be on Ms. Thai Cow, uh, who is appears to want to continue testing with PSI, but we have blocked her because of the incident last year. So she's waited an entire year. Hello? If you could mute yourselves, but this is a good time if you do have a question. Um, otherwise, I, I prompt, you know, I welcome anyone from the board to guide me how we want to proceed with Ms. Cal. And we've had situations like this, unfortunately. Uh, what we've done in the past is after the year is up and we've received something in writing saying that they wish to continue or go back to testing, we've allowed that. We've taken the flag off and they've gone back to testing. If, if the board is okay with something like that, we would um, make sure that we get something in writing and um, go ahead and release her to PSI unless the board wants to treat it differently or wants her to present something by February. Any be your recommendation Roxanne. you know you know the, the downside is that we didn't get anything in writing timely um, the letter that was sent last December says you need to wait a full year and then present something I think there is a language barrier so that could justify and I always uh, I never want to hinder you know um, put some set someone behind because of the language barrier so I'm, I'm cautious of that and and don't want to put them at a disadvantage knowing the history that in the past after that year we've allowed people to retest my thought would be to let her go back to testing I mean clearly she'd gone through school something happened during that exam and and we've allowed that in the past and if the board's comfortable with it I would still ask to get something in writing from her, um, but I, you know, I'd hate to have her wait until that first week in February um, if, if she really is inclined to start testing and, and working in the industry. Judy McAllister, uh, Roxana, we've allowed them to test uh, after they've complied before. So yes, after the year time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then I think we should let her test, but if she gets in, then I think the penalty should be worse. Okay, okay. So we have a motion for this applicant, um, even though, and, and the board isn't reviewing anything because I, I don't have anything to show you. I've got a license number and her information, so she will have to present something in writing, but the motion right now is, given the historical items that we've done this in the past, allow her to start testing again, and that motion is by Ms. Judy McAllister. Am I correct in rephrasing your motion, Ms. McAllister? You are. Okay, we have a second for that. Jenny Ross. I'll I'll motion. Thank you, Ms. Janie Ross. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions, conversations regarding this situation? Okay. And I think I think we're getting tired, but I am so appreciative of everything we've gotten done. I will go through roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Ron Gillahan. 
Okay, Ms. Becky Russell. Yes. Thank you, Kelly Barger. Mm -hmm. Yes. Judy McAllister. Yes. Trisha Parsons. Yes. Mona Sappenfield. Ms. Mona Sappenfield. Thank you. Uh, Frank Cambusa. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Amy Tanksley. Yes. Anita Charlton. Yes. Wybeck Granger. Wybeck Granger. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Was that a yes? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Susan Winter? Yes. And Ms. Janie Ross? Yes. Ms. Janie Ross? Thank you. Okay. Um, board members, that is the last thing that I have. I'm sure you're tired of hearing from me. Um, any other items that you have questions about, want to discuss? Otherwise, I'm, I'm definitely done. Roxana, it's Mona Southfield. I was wondering if there was an administrative or a legal update on Mr. Donald Paris, who we at our last board meeting. Uh, Michael Under, are you still with us, Mike? Pam? I believe on the redacted legal report, there might have been a case that needs to be um, presented and delayed until February. So there's no real update. I've kept up with it with Mike. Um, COVID-19 has posed, as we keep referring back to this, some unique situations. And so he is definitely working to resolve this. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. That's a great question. Anything else, members? Trisha Parsons, I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas. Be safe. Hope to see y'all soon. Thank you, Patricia. I appreciate that. It is 1121. Do I, um, Ms. Russell, you're in charge, or um, do you think we're adjourning? All right. I'd just like to say thank you to the members and guests for attending and participating in today's me meeting. Uh, I also want to wish you all a happy holiday and more in health, uh, more important, a healthy and with that, I'll entertain the uh, motion to adjourn. Judy McAllister, Patricia Parsons, second. Thank you, and I will do roll call vote just so we are consistent and follow through. We have a motion by Judy McAllister and a second by Patricia Parson to adjourn and uh, by roll call vote. Ron Gillahan. Key Russell. Yes. Ellie Barger. Yes. Judy McAllister. Judy McAllister. Yes. Thank you, Patricia Parsons. Yes. Ms. Sappenfield. Yes. Frank Ambusa. Thank you. Yes. Amy Tankley. Yes. Anita Charlton. Yes. Merry Christmas. Why, Happy Holidays. Happy New Year. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Wyvet Granger. Ms. Wyvet Granger. I'm sorry. I'm, about the, I'm sorry about the delay. I got my twin grandchildren. Oh, oh, but, oh. yes. <laughs> Thank you. What fun. Susan, Ms. Uh, Susan Witcher. Yes. And Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you. Same to you, Miss Janie Ross. Yes, and I miss everyone. Yes, thank you, and definitely Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Miss you all. Hopefully February we will be together. I have nothing else. Thank you all for being here, and to our public that joined us, very appreciated. Uh, we are adjourned then. Bye, thank everybody. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.